Thank you for um, supporting the Heritage Group, and I hope you enjoy this evening. Can I just ask you please to switch your mobiles off so we don't have any interruptions? And, and we'll crack straight on. If I can just introduce Stuart Burg Burgess. He's from uh, the Summerleaton Estate in, in Suffolk, which, as he'll explain, is part, a whole part of this setup. And it was, he says it was the most important part, but we don't think so. <laughs> anyway, I'll leave you to Stuart. Yes, I th I'd like to say my ramp is bigger than yours. <laughs> yes, well, thank you very much for attending tonight. It's a nice turnout. Um, the talk will take two strands. The first half will be about 45 minutes introducing the whole concept of the floating tank or the swimming tank, and we'll look at the assault water wings of Fritton, which was the freshwater wing, and Stokes Bay, which was the salt water, the, the sea wing. And then we'll have a cup of tea and a break and a bit of a natter, and then we'll resume sharply about quarter past eight to look specifically at Burton and its role, particularly after D-Day. So uh, if I speak too fast or you can't hear, raise your hand. Actually, don't raise your hand. I can't see a thing with these lights. So you have to shout out, perhaps. And any questions, if we can leave them to the end, that would be handy, if that's okay. Right, the first thing I noticed tonight when I came in was everyone was saying, where's Fritton? Never heard of Fritton. So I just thought I'd put this uh, map up to show you. Uh, Fritton is on the Norfolk-Suffolk border, owned by the Summer Leighton Estate. We're a big 5,000-acre estate, so perhaps a comparable size to Normanby. And then Gosport, which is right down on the south coast, um, just below Fareham, which we'll sort of introduce later on, was an important wing. So there's three key wings, Fritton, uh, Stokes Bay, and Burton, and then there were lots of subsidiary sites for minor trials and training. And we'll just have a little look at the history of the, the swimming tank, how it evolved before we really look at Fritton Lake. So here we have Fritton Lake, beautiful place. Big lake, three-mile lake uh, running through it. And it's a country park, Lake Normanby, 40,000 visitors a year. Uh, and we specialise with rowing boats and, and children's play and education. Uh, Stokes Bay uh, in Hampshire is a salt water ring, and there we have one of our pictures of Burton, uh, for your information. But you need to turn the clock back. You need to turn it back to 1942, when the Allied forces, mainly Canadians, were involved in a, a big raid at Dieppe. And it was fairly well planned, but they uh, assumed they could take back one of the ports, i.e. Dieppe. Uh, but what the problem was, it was fortified by big cliffs on one side and by heavy batteries on the other. So when they brought these large craft holding uh, just conventional tanks... Uh, to support the infantry, most of the tanks got stuck on the beaches. They couldn't even get off the beaches, and they were pinned down. There was loads of casualties and loads of deaths. 10,000 people uh, were captured, um, and it was a complete a nightmare. And the uh, military planners had said to do a role or undertaking of this nature in future needs to be better organised with a range of specialised tanks that could undertake a secondary role. And this is where Major General Percy Hobart came in, he was appointed the commander of the 79th Armoured Division, and his role was to develop a range of tanks that could not just fight with their, their primary gun, but do a secondary role. So firstly, we have this armoured ramp carrier. It's like a bridge layer. We'd just drop a bridge over a, where a, a short bridge would have been blown up. We then have the, the Sherman Flail. It's quite a special tank, really. This actually destroys uh, mines. So instead of going there with a metal detector and a flag, which takes ages, you just go through it and flail, bang, 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 bang. Uh, it was very effective. Then have the Fascine carrier. This was a, a turretless tank that would drop big coils of, of like um, a chestnut fencing into ditches and allow vehicles to cross. It'd often take two to three rows of this to actually fill the trench in. And then lastly, an armoured ramp carrier, which would... Uh, go over the defences that Hitler built called the Atlantic Wall. He built this big concrete structure right there along the French coast, which again, in places, was very impassable. Now, the idea of swimming tanks came about because they needed to support the infantry in the first wave of attacks. There's no point having loads of little men on a beach being shot at if you can't get your tanks on. And, it, of course, if you've got big ships coming in, they're easy targets for your German uh, heavy artillery and, and, and fire. Now, they thought about the swimming tank earlier between the wars, but the trouble is they're either too wide, in the case of this Covenator, uh, and also it would need an extra fuel tank to go across the, uh, the Solent, across the channel, um, or they had to make them too flimsy, so thin that they were light enough to float, 
and then the firepower was so rubbish, uh, it was a waste of time. And in 1941, Nicholas Strausler, a uh, Hungarian-born uh, refugee, he developed the notion of a swimming tank, and it works on displacement theory, purely and simply that if you can displace an equivalent weight of water, a item will float, so you can make anything float. And here we have a Sherman, and it's fairly simple what they did. They fitted on a skirt around the running gear, added inflated tubes, which were inflated by compressed air, a series of concentric rings to give it structure, and then finally a canvas um, outer skin. You note at the back there are propellers there to give it propulsion. And it was the propulsion with the tracks and with the, the uh, propellers that gave it its name duplex drive, i.e. two forms of propulsion. Now, in 1942, he took a Tetrarch light tank, about six tonnes, to Raysbury in Middlesex, and he trialled out floating the equipment uh, on the reservoir there. And you can see at the bottom picture that really and truly it looks no different to a rowing boat, does it? It's fairly small, but again, it, you know, six tonnes is nothing. But you've got to realise all the tank is under the water, and the chap is actually standing on in more or less the running gear. So, uh, you know... the they're good, but again, it's, it was the fact that they said, yeah, this will work, right. And they gave him then a Valentine tank. Now, these were between 13 and 16 tonnes, so a lot heavier, required a higher screen of about six or seven foot. And, but the beauty of the Valentine was that its hull was naturally boat shape. So in other words, it was pointy at the front and, and flat at the back. The only disadvantage was that the turret uh, would project over the screens at the front, so they had to crank the turret to the back over the engine, so when you turned up at a, a, a defended beach, you'd have to drop your screens and then rotate your turret round to fire. So that was quite a disadvantage. And for one of those reasons, uh, it was decided to go with the Sherman for D-Day. Now, the Americans had developed the, the Sherman. It's a 30-ton tank. It took a five-man crew compared to a three-man crew of, of the Valentine. But conversely, it needed two propellers to power it and a much, much higher screen to displace the 30 tons of water. So in effect, you've got a 9.5 to 10 foot high screen, meaning that when the tank is in the water, all the tank is below the water line. So there's a big, big risk of water coming over the screens and actually flooding the tank. Now to get away with this, what they did was fit a bilge pump, like you do on a conventional boat, at the lowest point of the tank's uh, body, and so any water coming in would be automatically pumped out, and it would actually deal uh, quite well when it was running. The trouble was it was run off the engine, so if you stalled and you start taking on water, you, you're in trouble. Uh, and they later developed an uh, independently battery-powered one or a secondary one to just run, so you, you could uh, you know, run it if the engine stalled, for example. And you can see at the bottom the height of the, the, the tubes on the tank. This is actually on a later model, the, the turret on this Sherman's much, much longer than this one here. So at the end of 1942, they took the Valentine tanks up to Scotland, uh, to practice uh, introducing syllabuses and um, trials and, and sort of tribulations, if you like, to see how the tanks performed at sea. The uh, freshwater trials were very successful, but in a, in a force two or three of uh, water, these Valentines could cope very well with the rough seas. Uh, and then in, um, in early 1943, they set up a small training wing at Narford, which is in sort of mid-Norfolk between Norwich and Kings Lynn, uh, on a very small 60-acre lake, which was only big enough to take about 10 tanks at once. And as soon as they set up the syllabus and the, um, and the instructors were trained, they realised the lake was far too small uh, to train a whole regiment or two squadrons. So here we have Narford, a very pretty place, a bit prettier than Normby perhaps, I don't know. Can I say that? I don't know. Um, and then we've got this lovely little lake, and the things that are required to launch a tank in any circumstances is somewhere hard, from land to sea, and you'd also need one of these. This is an immersion pool. You don't want to stick your tank in the river or sea or Fritton Lake unless you've made sure that you've waterproofed it. So they have to do lots of work to stop the water getting into the tank, which we'll talk about in a minute. So every site should have one of these. We'll come back to that in a minute. So here's beautiful Fritton Lake, like I say, 180-acre lake, three miles long. Um, it's very well suited for a, a training location for many reasons. A, it's in the middle of nowhere. B, it's surrounded by trees. And C, um, it was big enough to take the two regiments. 